Okay, today we're going to talk about data frames. A data frame is a popular data structure. It's in many languages. Uh, for example, in Python, you might have seen pandas. And it's used for storing data in tabular form, where the rows are instances and the columns represent features of those instances. We'll give a clear example in a second. So dataframes.jl, it has many functions that operate on data frames and that will allow us to query and manipulate data, work with data, and it also handles missing values very efficiently. We'll use the CSV package to read in comma-separated value files that are commonly used to store data tables, and you can check out the documentation of both packages here where you can learn a lot more. So I'll start by um, loading in the data frame CSV package, and we'll also load in the statistics package because we're going to use the mean function to take uh, the mean of certain columns. And then this is so that the with terminal command works so that we can print things in Pluto. So I'll start by showing you how you can construct a data frame from scratch. Let's suppose that this data frame is going to contain information about cities in the United States. So the row is going to represent a city. Each column is going to represent an attribute of the cities. So uh, we can make an array of cities. Uh, we'll put Corvallis. Portland and Eugene, so all Oregon cities in here, okay. We'll make an array, and let's list the population of these cities as well in, in a separate array. So 57961, 64, 5, and then 1, 6, 8, 9, 1, 6, okay. So Corvallis has this population, Portland has this population, Eugene has this population. Now, uh, the data is all here, but um, this is sort of annoying because, say I swap these two um, entries in cities, then I also need to swap these two accordingly, right? And so that's what's nice about a data frame, uh, among many things. Um, it inherently keeps track of the fact that these um, are associated with each other. Portland's associated with that population, Eugene's associated with that population. So you can build a data frame as follows. So we'll say um, DF cities, we'll call it data frame cities because it's about cities. So this is the data frame constructor. And then I give the name of the um, of the array. So we'll have cities. Oh, and I'll rename this as city, okay? So we pass city in here and then population equals population. Okay, and voila, we have a data frame. So here you can see the columns, um, city, population, and each row. Um, and it tells you the type of the data inside the column as well here. Okay, so we could just as easily have done, instead of typing that in, um, let me comment this out, we could just as easily put the arrays directly in here, right? And then it's understood, oh yeah, the first entry of that array corresponds with the first entry of that array and so on. So maybe this is a more clear way to put it, okay? So you can also do that, it gives you the same thing. Okay, so now that we have this data frame, let's say we want to append some rows to it. Okay, so we're going to append uh, Berkeley in California and Bend, Oregon in, in their populations into this. Okay, the first approach by which we can do that is um, to think of the data frame as an array. Uh, each row is an array, and then we can use the push command just like we've used for arrays. So push DF cities. And then the new row is going to be bend uh, in its population, okay? And it's understood that the first column corresponds to city, second column corresponds to population, so the order here does matter, okay? And so we'll push that. And um, because this has an exclamation mark, it actually modified the data frame. So now, indeed, that row is pushed to the data frame, okay? Um, so now we have a new row. The second approach for push a new row is to think of the rows of the data frame as a dictionary. Um, so then we can um, push a dictionary, okay? So we can say um, new row equals dictionary, and uh, the city is going to be um, Berkeley, and the population is going to be This is my new row, it's a dictionary, and it represents um, Berkeley, right? And then we can push this to the data frame. And 
and voila, we have a new row of Berkeley. And um, note the dictionaries inherently don't have an order for the key value pairs, but, um, and that's what's the, the advantage of using a dictionary is you don't need to worry about the order like you did here. You just sort of give it the keys and values and then it will append the appropriate value with the key that matches the uh, column. So yeah, if you have a lot of columns, I think a dictionary is better. That way you don't have to assume the order and think about the order too carefully. Okay, so how do you append columns to a data frame? Let's say we have a new column. We want to talk about the rainfall of all of the cities. So the first way you can do that is say DF cities, and it's sort of like an array, uh, except they want you to use an exclamation mark here because you're, you're modifying all the rows. And then you just give it the new column name. So we'll call it rain, okay? And then we put in the values that we want. And of course, the order of this array has to correspond to the orders of these rows. So we'll have 51, 43, 47, 12, uh, 25.0, okay? And then if we look at DF cities, we should see, voila, we have a new column for the rain for each city, okay? The second way that we could do this is to use an insert calls function, okay? So this way is um, treat the column like an array. So, so yeah, you treat the data frame like an array, except the columns are called by the symbol name. Okay, so we have a, a symbol here, okay? Okay, the other way that we can do it is with the function insert calls. Okay, and it's an exclamation mark because we're going to modify the data frame. So we put in our data frame, okay? And then um, let's say we also want to put in the, what the state is here. And the second entry of insert calls is what column do we want it to be? And uh, what, this, what this here did is it appended this rain column as the last column, but let's say we want to put the state right here. So it's the second column. So we can pass this to to say, all right, let's make the second column be the state. So that's gonna be the column name. And then that gets um, the, the states that correspond to those cities. So we've got Oregon, Oregon, Oregon and um, Oregon and CA. Okay. And uh, voila, we have our um, states, the state column here in, in column two. So this is nice because it allows you to put the column exactly where you want it. How many rows or columns are in the data frame? If you use the size command, which also works on multidimensional arrays, we'll sort of look at it as the, a multi-dimensional array, and this has five rows and four columns. So um, rows by columns, just like a multi-dimensional array. Let's suppose we want to rename a column. I don't like the wor word just to use rain, so maybe I want to call it rainfall instead. So we can say rename, and I want to put an exclamation mark because again, we're going to actually modify the data frame that we're passing in. Okay. And we, we say what column we want to rename, and then what we want the na new name to be. So we're mapping rain to rainfall. Okay, and voila, the rain column has been changed to rainfall. Okay. Deleting a row. Let's say, uh, let's first add a, a sort of bogus row because we want to keep all of our rows actually. So we'll add a bogus row, um, bogus, and then uh, for the state, whatever. Uh, as a population of zero, no one lives there, and that's how much rainfall it yeah, has, okay? Uh, and then we'll add another row. This time we're going to not add a bogus row, but we're going to make a duplicate of this row, Berkeley, okay? Add a duplicate row here for Berkeley, which is what I've done. Um, and so now we have two of the rows that are the same, okay? And so this kind of gives us two reasons to delete rows. One, we have a duplicate, and two, we added a bogus row. Okay, so we can delete this bogus row, which is row five, by using the same function uh, that we use to delete entries in an array. So we're, um, so you can say delete, exclamation mark, because we're modifying DF cities, and we want to delete the sixth row, okay? And voila, the sixth row is deleted. And now we could manually delete the sixth row or fifth row here to account for this duplicate, but let's say, you know, there's a million rows here, we want to figure out which are duplicates and just drop the duplicates. What's really cool is Julia does that for you, data frames does that for you, and they overloaded the unique function. 
So if you say unique DF cities, what that's going to be, do is go through all the rows and only keep the unique ones. And you'll see that it was smart enough to find, oh, this, these two rows are duplicate. We're going to drop one of them. We're only going to keep unique rows. Okay, so this has five unique rows. So that's a, another way to delete a row, but it's doing it in a smart way. So manual deletion and deletion of um, duplicates. So how do we delete a column? Let's make it a bogus column. So bogus call equals random. We'll just put random numbers there. Five, okay? So we've got random, random numbers here, and I'll show you what it looks like. So this is what it looks like. Oops, I want to show you the whole data frame. So this is what it looks like. Now, now we have this bogus column here, okay? What we can do is use the select command. So by selecting uh, DF cities, uh, for example, I can select the state. And what that's going to do is give me a data frame with only the state. Um, let's see if, if you do uh, multiple columns, what it will do. I'm not sure if this will work. Oh yeah, it will work for multiple columns as well, okay? So what you could do is put in all the columns names, right? So uh, rainfall and type them in there, uh, city. So you could do that and then you're getting rid of the bogus call, but that's not very elegant. Uh, so what you could do is say not bogus call. Okay, and so it's smart enough to know I want all columns that are not the bogus call. Okay, and voila, I deleted all columns except for that. Pretty cool, right? But if I look at DF cities, oh, the bogus column is still there. Why is that? Well, it's because we didn't put an exclamation mark there because we want to actually modify the data frame. Okay, so now I'll do that and I'll run this again. And indeed, that column has been deleted. But what if you want to know what the column names in the data frame are? Well, you've learned by now that the column names are symbols because we've been using symbols to query the columns. And so if you use the names command, that's going to give you the names of the columns. And you'll see that this is going to be an array. Oh, it's, it's actually giving strings. Um, it used to be symbols, interesting. Um, but, but yeah, and if you do have a column that is uh, sort of a fancy string and it has spaces, remember something like this average, if you say average salary, that's not, that doesn't make sense. What you need to do, say average salary, and then convert that to a symbol, okay? And then you would use this to query the column name, okay? So that's for, for future reference, okay? But yeah, so if you say names, it actually gives you a an array of strings of the column names, okay? Okay, so if you want to iterate through a data frame row by row, uh, there's a special iterator for data frames that I use very often. Uh, it's called each row. So we can say for row in each row, DF cities. Okay, and, and inside here, we're going to have a row at our fingertips. In this row, you have to think of it as a dictionary. Okay, so think of this as a dictionary. We're going to print um, the row and we're going to put the city. So we're going to pull out the city, okay, for example. Okay, and what this is going to do is print the cities. Okay, but as a dictionary, you can get any population you want, anything about the, the row that you want. Um, so, so let's see what all, what all we have. So we can have city uh, in, and then we can call the state. Um, has a population of, and then get the population and print, print those things out. So, so that's sort of how you loop through the, rays, the, the rows of a data frame and call out each attribute of the rows. So you think of the row as a dictionary inside of here. You can do whatever computations or printing you'd like. How do you retrieve a column from a data frame? So this is going to be useful for when you want to make a plot. Um, and so the first, because you need to pull out vectors. Um, so the first approach is to treat it like an array. Um, so let me show you DF cities again. So there's reference. Okay, so one way to do it, which I don't want you to do, let's say with the population column, you can say, oh, that's the third column, okay? So you can say, I want all the rows in the third column, just treating it like a multidimensional array and that will work. But my argument is that this is bad practice. Instead, what we should do is use the names because that's the beauty of data frames. 
the columns are named. And so if this switches and becomes column two, then it will call the right column still. And your code is more readable this way because no one can remember what the third column is. Okay, so, um, oops, population, and voila, we've got the population. So you say you want all the rows and the population, okay? You can also treat the data frame as if it were a structure, a, as if you coded out a structure. So you can say df dot, and you hit tab, the different um, attributes come up, and then you have an array here, okay? If you want a certain row, well, yeah, it's just like a, a data frame, right? So if you want the third row and say all the columns, Oh, DF cities. This will give you a row, right? And so if you want the third and fourth row, you can do that. It's just like an array, but the columns are named, okay? If you want a certain entry, let's say you want the third row and you want the state. No problem. We've got organ. Combination of rows and columns. So I sort of already showed you that. So we want, uh, say we want three to end. Um, and we only want the city and the state, okay? You can pass an array and slice it based on the city and state. So you only get the city and state here, okay? And then third to end row. If you want the unique entries in a column, you can just pull out the column. So we'll do it this way, okay? And then there's a unique function in Julia, and it will basically so this here is an array, right? This is an array, okay? So there's a unique function that takes in an array and returns which elements are unique. It's going to give you Oregon, California. Okay, querying a data frame. The first example is let's query all rows where the city name is Corvallis, okay? And that's just going to give us one row here in this case. Uh, the first way to do it is treat it like an array again, okay? So remember when we do, um, so we can look at the DF, all the rows, and city, and we wanna find when it's equal to, we wanna element-wise, do an element-wise comparison, right? And find when that's equal to Corvallis. So let me actually show you line by line. This is going to get all the cities, and what I wanna do is find out which one of these entries are Corvallis, okay? So I'm gonna do an element-wise comparison, okay? The first one is Corvallis, right? And then I can slice the array. So this is a Boolean array. Okay. So I'm going to slice DF cities, you can get as an array, the rows, and I'm going to get all the columns. And voila, I have uh, the row that corresponds to Corvallis. Okay. Uh, the more elegant way, which I also like and is more flexible, is the filter function. So for the filter function, we put a function in first, and this function operates on each row of the data frame. And it's going, it doesn't have to be anonymous, but I'm going to make an anonymous function. So I have my row to map to, well, I want to get the city. And if it's equal to Corvallis, so if this row, if this condition holds out to be true, that means we want to keep it. And if it's false, we want to throw it away. Okay? So this is going to take the rows, look at the city, and compare it to Corvallis. Is that city Corvallis? If true, we're going to keep that row. Then we pass in our data frame and voila, we've got it, okay? And note that I didn't put an exclamation mark here because I don't want to actually modify my data frame, okay? But you, it does work with exclamation mark too, okay? Here's another example. Let's query all cities where the population is less than 500K, okay? So now what I'll do is filter and I still wanna take a row, but this time I wanna look at the population and I wanna see if it's less than 500,000. Okay. Oh, voila. We have all rows where the population is less than 500,000. So Berkeley here is gone. Oh, Berkeley. No, Berkeley's here. Oh, Portland. Portland is the one that dropped. Okay. Query all cities in the state of Oregon. Okay. It's getting monotonous. I'll copy and paste this. I'll look at the state and see if that state is equal to Oregon. And voila. We dropped Berkeley this time because it's in California. Sorting. How do we permute the rows such that the columns are sorted according to a value? And this is where it's really apparent that having all of your data, tabular data in a data frame instead of a bunch of different vectors, one for each column, is, is much more convenient. 
So to sort, we can use the sort function. And we're going to actually sort the data frame, meaning modify what's passed in. You pass in the data frame, and you say, by what column do I want to sort by? Here, I want to sort by the population. And then there's an optional argument. I always like to put it in anyways, just so it's clear and readable. Uh, reverse order uh, is true. So now that what that means is the population is going to be in reverse, meaning from uh, highest to lowest. Okay. So now we have the most populous city and the least populous city. So that's how you sort a data frame. Grouping. The group by command is very common uh, in many languages for querying data. And what it does is it partitions the rows of the data frame into multiple data frames, those are the groups, such that the rows in each of those data frames will share a common attribute in the column. Okay? And such a data structure, a group data frame, it's very useful for, for performing computations on different groups within a data frame. All right, for example, here, there are naturally two groups. We have uh, cities in Oregon and some cities in, in, in California, okay? So here, what we're going to do is group the cities uh, by state. And to do that, we say group by, we pass in the data frame, um, and then we pass in uh, what we want to group the rows by, by what column. And we want to group it by the state, okay? Okay, and if we do that, you can see that it splits the rows into two. This first data frame contains cities in Oregon, and this contains cities in California. Okay, and we'll give this a, um, a name. So we'll say this is group by state. Okay, give it a name. And it works just like an array. So if I call first entry, this gives you the first data frame, the first group. Okay, those are the Oregon cities. The second entry gives you the California cities. Okay, so more, we might want to iterate through those groups and you can do that. Uh, this is an array, so you can just say, um, you can just iterate through that. So we can say for df state and gb state, or if you really want, we can, we can do it again to make it clear. Okay, and, and then in here, you will have access to these groups uh, at your fingertips inside the loop and it will change. So first, what I like to do is just get what state it is. So this state is going to be uh, so we're going to get the first row in the state. That's just a fancy way to grab this state right here. And then when it's one, you'll grab the first row in this state. So it just gets what state we're in in this group. And then we might want to perform a computation on the a column in, in that group. To do that, let's say we want to get the mean rainfall. So um, average rainfall in this state. We're going to take the mean of, well, we look at this uh, partition of the data frame, get all the rows, and get the rainfall, okay? And we're going to take the mean of that, okay? And then what I'm going to do is print line. Uh, we want to print um, the rainfall. Average rainfall in this state is, and then we'll, we'll, we'll print this, okay? Okay. And indeed, we've, we've got the average rainfall here. So this would be the average rainfall in Oregon, and this is the average rainfall in California. So this is a nice example where we're gonna split up the data frame into groups here, according to uh, what state they are in, and then perform computation on those groups. Here we wanna get the ra average rainfall within each state, which is what we've done, okay? Okay, often we want to split up the data frame into groups, apply a function, just like we did, right here, but then we want to combine the result into one data frame, kind of like right here. We have um, Oregon and this rainfall, average rainfall in Oregon. Here we have California, average rainfall in California. So it's like a new data frame in some sense with just two rows, one for each group, okay? And that's exactly what we want to do here. So the combine function does that, okay? So first of all, the first argument to combine is a group data frame. So you can pass in your group data frame or just call it again, just for clarity. I'll call it again here, uh, even though it's uh, probably better to just compute the group by once because it's faster, but here it doesn't matter. So I'm gonna group by state. So this is a group data frame right here that I'm passing in to combine, okay? 
And then what I write is uh, which column I want to do a computation on. Within the group, I want to look at the rainfall column, all right? And then I want to apply a certain function to that rainfall column, which is the mean. So that means take the mean of the column. And because this is wrapped in a combine, so, so this right here is essentially doing what we did up here, but then the combine is going to combine the result and make this into a data frame. So I'll show you, okay? Here's what we have, Oregon and its mean rainfall, and then California and its mean rainfall, which is 25, okay? And it's a data frame, right? Very nice. Um, one thing you might not like is, let's say you don't like the rainfall underscore mean. What you can do is give this a new column name. So I want the, the result of this computation to be called average rainfall. And voila, that's, that's the name of the column, the new name. Uh, you could also just rename the column, but I like, I like to give it a name. Okay, here's another example. What if we want to group by the state and determine if the sum of the rainfall is less than 50? Okay, well, let's group by. We're gonna group by the state. Okay, so that gives us a group data frame. All right, and we wanna combine the result after applying a function. And this function is going to see if the sum is less than 50. Now we could look at the rainfall, right? And do the sum, right? And that gives you the sum of the rainfall. And this, this example here is really no different than up here. But actually what I want to do is a little bit more complicated. I want to sum the column and then see if that sum is less than 50. So what's nice is you can do it in anonymous function. And this makes it really clear that what this function is doing is operating in columns. So I'm going to take the column and I'm going to map it to, well, the sum of the column and compare it to 50. So if the sum is less than 50, sum of that column is less than 50, then I'm going to return a true. Okay, and then that will see now. Now this returns true, so and this returns false. Okay, and see how it calls a rainfall function. Well, that's not a very nice name, so I can again call that a different name, which is going to be um, we'll call it uh, not much rainfall. Okay, because this represents whether or not there's a lot of rain. So not much rain, California, true, not much rain, Oregon, false. Okay. Uh, oh, here's another neat one. Group by state and then compute the rainfall per person. Okay, so I'll copy this. Still grouping by state, but we gotta think carefully about the function that we're going to apply. So this is one that's neat because we're going to be looking at two different columns. We need two columns for this, right? We need to get the, both the rainfall and the population. But we can write a function that maps these two columns to a number, okay? So here's the syntax for it. I probably have to look it up every time, so that's why I'm looking over here. So we can take the population column and the rainfall column. So now it's an array because we need both the columns. We can't just map one of them to something. So it's the same paradigm as before. We say, okay, these columns, we wanna apply a function to them, okay? And that function is going to be well, we define a, an anonymous function. And this time we want to take the population column and the rain column, right? You need to have two here because you're really taking, you have a, a pair of columns. And map that to, well, we want to sum up the rain column and sum up the population column. Okay, so this is going to give the rain per person. I don't know why you'd want that, but yeah. So that gives you your, yeah, so, and again, the, the name is not very nice, so we're gonna give it a new name. So this is rainfall per person. Yep, okay, and there we go. So what it's done is it took the rain and divided by the population. Rain divided by population. Okay, so this is an advanced example, but I think it's cool to show how powerful this paradigm is. How do we write a CSV, or how do we write a data frame to a CSV file? So I'll show you via the CSV package. So we say csv.write, and we say what we want the, the file to be. Um, so cities data, okay? 
and then you say what, what data frame you want to write to file, okay? And remember, you could call certain rows and certain columns in here if you only want to write certain columns and rows to the, to the file. Just to show you that it indeed printed out, so this is a Linux command to cat a file, citiesdata.csv. I'm gonna cat this file out, see what it looks like. And this is the CSV file, so you have the column names, um, and then each row is the data, and they're separated by columns. So, great. How do you read in a CSV into a data frame? Okay, well, I have a CSV file here. It's up two directories, and it's called incomes.csv. Okay, so if you look at PWD where we are now, this is the current directory that we're in. Um, and what I want to do is go back two directories and go into the data folder, okay? So I can use join path to do that. Data, um, and then uh, it's called income.csv. And this should be the file name. This is the file name that I want, okay? And then I can use the CSV package to read that in. So csv.read. Um, and then you have to say, okay, I want to read this into a data frame. So the second argument is data frame, okay? Okay, it does not exist. Okay, so how do we read in a CSV file into Julia as a data frame? So I have a CSV file here, um, two directories up. Um, incomes.csv, so I need to go back two directories and into the data folder of this uh, GitHub repo. Um, so if, if you go to the GitHub repo under the data folder, that's where we have uh, this CSV file. Okay, so we can say csv.read and then give the path to the file. So join path here, it's two directories up, it's in the data folder and it's called incomes.csv. Okay. And again, if you want to make sure that that file is there, you can say is file just to make sure you got the path right. True, there is a file there. So if I mess it up and said, yeah, that's false. Okay. So that's the, the file name. Okay, so we're going to read that in. The second argument is a data frame, just a data frame type, and that tells you we want to read it in as a data frame. Okay. So here's our data frame and, and see there's data on cities still. So we have the per capita income in three different cities, all right? So let's call this DF incomes. So we can assign it a variable, all right? And work with it later. So now that we've loaded this data in from a CSV file, um, there's some commonalities between this and the data frame we've um, defined because they, they share some of these cities. So both Corvallis and Berkeley share uh, are shared between those. And we, maybe we want to take the per capita income and, and automatically put it onto here, at least for Berkeley and Corvallis, right? So that's called a join when you want to combine two different data frames. And there are seven different types of joins. I'm going to tell you about two of them. You can guess what the others are. Um, so, so one is the inner join, and I'll show you how that works. So if we say inner join, let me remind you what these look like. So we have DF cities and DF incomes. Okay. Okay. So the inner join, let's see what it does. So we pass these two in. Okay. And we need a third argument which says, what do we want to join on? What's the key by which we want to join them on? How are these related? And they're related by the city column. That's the thing they have in common. Okay. And if we do that, what it's going to do is find all rows they have a common city, okay? And here, only Berkeley and Corvallis are common between the two, okay? And so you can see that it kept the data from this data frame, okay? And it tagged on the per capita income in the appropriate spot, okay? And so even though Corvallis is first here and it's last here, it, it put it in the right uh, order, okay? So Corvallis gets 19,000, yeah. Okay, and it dropped the other rows. So that's called an inner join, okay? Now, an outer join, on the other hand, will keep all of the rows. So basically, it's not going to throw away San Francisco. 
It's not going to throw away Portland, Eugene, and Bend. It's going to keep them and keep the data that we do have and put in missing for the data that we don't have, okay? So we're gonna call this uh, DFOJ for outer join. So we'll do the same thing, but instead of inner, we're gonna say outer. Okay, and voila, you can see that there's missing data types now, okay? There's missings in here because uh, San Francisco did not have this information in the other data frame, and uh, our new data frame we read in for file did not have uh, information for Portland, Eugene, and Bend. Okay. So if you, if you look at uh, the, the types now here, so you can see the types disappear because they're now they're uh, missing. So if you look at the state, the, the type of this, it's an array um, and it's a union of missing and strings, okay? So missing is its own type in Julia, okay? So type of missing, it's its own type, okay? And often we want to drop rows that have missing values and you can do that using drop missing. So let's say you want to do that and then it, it drops these two. So if you put a call, a, an exclamation mark there, um, then it would drop all the rows with missings. So all of these, because each has missing here. Um, and actually modify the data frame. Well, we don't, we're not going to put an exclamation mark there because I don't want to. Okay, so let's just show, this will return a new data frame. So you could call this dfoj uh, no missing. Yeah, something like that. Okay, another thing we might not want to do is be a bit more conservative in dropping our rows. And um, let's only remove rows that have missing in the state column, right? But we're okay with these missings in different columns, okay? So what you can do is say drop missing dfoj, but only if there's a missing in the state column. And voila, it only dropped um, the entry with the missing state, which was San Francisco, and then it kept these because we don't mind if there's a missing in the per capita income column, okay? Yeah, so, so, so the, that's how data frames works, um, and that should be good enough to get you started.